Yeah, there we go. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome um, to this Founders Day lecture. This is the 70, 70th anniversary of Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary. So we're happy uh, for those of you here in person and those of you who are, are, are joining us virtually. Um, we are very excited to have uh, Dr. Larry Rasmussen tonight give the lecture. This is the, as you'll discover tonight, this is the perfect night for him to be here. Um, so we're happy to have him. We also have um, some special guests and um, some exciting announcements. So there'll be a little bit of a program before we hear from Dr. Rasmussen, but I'd like to begin tonight with a land acknowledgement, if we could. <clears throat> Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary of California Lutheran University acknowledges and honors its presence on the unceded ancestral lands of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people now colonial no, colonially known as Berkeley. The land from which we benefit continues to be a place of foremost importance to the Ohlone and all descendants of the Verona Band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land. Consistent with our values of community, inclusion, and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the seminary's relation, relationship to native peoples. As members of the Berkeley community, it is vitally important that we not only recognize the history of the land in which we stand, but also we recognize the Mwinka Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. BLTS is committed to actively pursuing our values as an anti-racist institution. We are committed to living our values by promoting the history and culture of the Ohlone people and sustaining an ongoing relationship which supports the resources and values of indigenous peoples and tribes. And so now I would like to invite um, Dr. Laurie Verlotta, the president of California Lutheran University to uh, come and, and make some introductions. Mm -hmm. Good evening, yeah, let's see if that's working. I'm very pleased to be here to bring you greetings on behalf of California Lutheran and the PLTS community on this Founders Day. Today, our community comes together to pause and to recognize and to celebrate the founders of this institution who decided to establish a seminary in the hills of Berkeley, California to prepare church leaders for the Lutheran Church. Those, those founders came together and opened a hilltop campus in 1952. But long before the Hilltop campus opened its doors, our seminary's history goes back to Portland, Oregon. In 1910, it was the Pacific Theological Seminary before it moved to Seattle, Washington in 1914. And then 100 years later, it merged with California Lutheran University in 2014. Our history suggests that the seminary's ability to flex and change and relocate are just a part of what has kept us so alive and well over the last century. Clearly, PLTS has demonstrated what it means to be rooted in Lutheran values and traditions, and at the same time, so very open to being both responsive to and anticipatory of the manifestations of the world we inhabit today. The world of the mid 21st century needs some mending, and PLTS is helping us to use our heads and our hearts and our hands to do some of that mending particularly in the areas of inclusive faith, social justice, including but not limited to DEIJ and climate justice work, which are all intricately related. At PLTS, this integration occurs largely in its very own center, the Center for Climate Justice and Faith. And who better to say a few words and to give us an update on this wonderful center than its esteemed leader, Dr. Cynthia Molabita. So I invite her up to say a few words. What an evening. Many of you have supported the PLTS Center for Climate Justice and Faith since it came into being two years ago at this very event, Founders Day. Thank you. Your support for something so new and at that point so untested and unproven has borne beautiful fruit. I say fruit because we see the center as a kind of tree 
with its programmatic branches and its two strong roots in the life-saving, life-giving love of God for this world and in the world-changing spirit of reformation that is inherent in Lutheranism. The tree has you, its supporters, as water and soil. Yes, the center is producing good fruit. Many of you are well aware of recent developments through the center's newsletter, The Wellspring, and we invite you to sign up if you don't receive it. So let me just point out a very few highlights that might be new to you. One, we have hired the perfect person to develop and coordinate the center's certificate in Spanish, certificate in climate justice and faith. Four strong institutions in four countries and two continents are busily at work developing and preparing that program for its launch in February, um, adapting it to various contexts from Argentina to Alaska, and then promoting it. It will launch and already has 20 applicants at this early point. The English certificate is deep into its second year. We had 55 strong applicants from and have selected, uh, could only accept 34 because that's our limit at this point. Um, we will be able to accept more next year. They represent 18 countries and 19 states of the US. We expect the three programs not for seminary um, students here, not, not, not our, our, um, our seminary students to have 80 people in this second year, 80 participants as compared to the 40 in its, in its first year. So this is good. Now, you might not know that every participant designs a sacred action project, which is our word for a kind of capstone project. Um, I'd like to bring you two voices from this year's participants who are only in their beginning of their third month and the Sacred Action Project isn't supposed to start till the fifth month, but they are already, they've got it underway. The participant in, Zib in Zimbabwe writes, I would like to register my commitment of mobilizing my community for 20 events to carry out creation care campaigns from the 6th of November, 2022 until the 27th of April, 2023. I am really benefiting and growing beautifully from the knowledge shared to me in the certificate in climate justice and faith. Many thanks to all the leaders and funders that made this learning possible. The program has helped me understand that I may seek to address the impacts of the climate crisis, has empowered me with knowledge, values, attitudes, and skill needed to act as an agent of change. Those were beautiful words. I just also received note that the first event uh, or some preliminary event he addressed 300 people. So, so then from Madagascar, three of us students in the Lutheran Faculty of Theology, that means the School of Theology, were selected by the Lutheran World Federation to receive the Certificate in Climate Justice and Faith Scholarship. Our project is called Climate Justice in Theory and Practice. Larry, you would love that. For awareness about climate change and climate justice, we organized a conference for all pastors and theologians who study at this school." End quote. Finally, a Lutheran pastor in Hawaii for her sacred action project last year built an interfaith movement for the closure and removal of a World War II toxic fuel facility that was leaking into an elementary school. As part of her project, she worked with faith leaders to publish a full page statement in the largest newspaper in Hawaii, calling for the closure of the facility. It was signed by 150 interfaith leaders 
from around the islands and launched the larger project. That's the power for the good that comes from training in community organizing for climate justice. So may these brief uh, glimpses bring you all the joy that comes with knowing that you're doing vitally important work when you support the center. And I, I would be a fool not to mention the amazingly gifted leadership team that is making this happening. Sarah Bird, raise your hand. The um, acting director during my sabbatical and the um, regular associate director. Phoebe Morad, the coordinator of the certificates and of the English certificate. Sister Kelly Marciales, the astounding community organizer who coordinates the community organizing program. And most recently, the Reverend Dr. Nedi Astudillo, who is coordinating the certificate in Spanish. They are dynamic, talented, faithful team. So with that brief update, I would like to turn this back over to Dr. Varlata for a splendid announcement. As the president of this institution, it does give me pride and joy, Cynthia, to support the Center for Climate Justice and Faith. In its short life, it has already become one of the most distinguished programs here at PLTS. And on a day that we recognize our founding leaders, it makes such good sense to thank you, Dr. Melabita, outstanding leadership. Under your competent and creative and loving leadership, the Center for Climate Justice and Faith has attracted nationwide support, in international recognition, and substantial philanthropic contributions. So there's no better time than today to briefly speak about the latter. And I'm thrilled to share with all of you here, and I wish my colleagues on Zoom could see, we have a very nice full room here. So for all of you who are virtually present and all of you who are here today in this wonderful room with me, I wanna share the, the great news that we received just two months ago, an irrevocable planned gift of a half a million dollars from the Reverend John Moline, a 1974 PLTS alumnus and his wife, Barbara. It's so great. And I'm keeping my fingers crossed and saying a prayer that John is able to hear us. He's having some technical difficulties. So I wanna say a few words um, about the afternoon that I shared with John and Barbara and my husband, who I rarely get to see, two months ago in Rochester, Minnesota. It was such a special day for four reasons. It was the first time in several weeks um, that I actually had the, the opportunity to sit down at a table and enjoy lunch. It was the week after school started. So I had, I had my lunch at a table rather than my desk. And it wasn't just any table, there was a big rock in the middle of the table. John picked this place called Twigs and Branches or something like that. And it was a hot rock that we Anybody? Okay, let's see, there we go. So um, we, um, the Reverend and I grilled our food. I had grilled shrimp, he had grilled steak. Our spouses weren't so adventurous. Now, uh, the third thing that made the day so special is that the four of us so easily entered into um, extraordinarily spirited conversations about things that matter. There was no talking about the weather or the traffic. We got into things about education and liberation and empowerment and the kinds of things that really matter in this world. And fourth, it was during that lunch that John and Barbara orally committed to making this irrevocable gift. So once we had that, um, that, that, that part of the conversation, I was so thrilled that I put my, my, my shrimp aside and I said, this is such fantastic news. Let's work to use this day 
as a day where we can use your irrevocable gift as a match. Let's pledge to raise a million dollars for the center during the fiscal year, which ends on May 31st of this year. So I left that lunch thinking we're going to set out to make um, to, to raise a million dollars. The Moline gift is named um, as a tribute to the late Wally and Barbara Stewart. It is directed to support the center and to recognize Wally's dedicated leadership to peace and justice issues. So let's give, um, let's, let's recognize Wally through a round of applause. So again, I wanna personally thank John and Barbara Moline for their vision to use this gift to recognize such an important person in the life of PLTS and to inspire other donors to support the Center for Climate Justice and Faith. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Cynthia to say a few more words. I too so hope that John and Barbara Moline can hear us. Um, and I also just want to acknowledge how splendid it would have been if Wally Stewart could have been here at this time. And we'll say a little bit more about Wally later on. Um, but to you, John and Barbara Meline, I would just say that you and your wise gift have ensured the future of this center. Um, now it will have water and sunlight for the years to come. Countless pastors and lay leaders, including the people influenced by the participants in the program, will be empowered for the work of climate justice, which may be the most important work in front of the species at this point as we hang in a precipice. John and Barbara, hoping you can hear. You have given of your hearts, your insight, your daring generosity, and your wisdom to help steer the course away from climate catastrophe. I believe you have listened to the nudging of the spirit. Then in response to John and Barbara's gift, and speaking of the spirit, on this Founders Day, it is also my deep pleasure to introduce or note the person whose initial and very large seed gift planted this tree two years ago. In this sense, John Panic, another John, is a founder of the center. So John, hoping that you are on Zoom, in the room on Zoom, we thank you. I'm not sure what it is about John Panic. I think he too listens closely to the spirit. But when we told him just two days ago about John and Maylene, John and Barbara Maylene's gift, he was very moved. He was moved by the gift, but also by the fact that the Maylene's intended it to be more than doubled by inspiring other gifts and that they intend this fund to include not only planned gifts, but living gifts to be used in the here and now. And finally, if I recall John's face correctly, he has a very expressive face. He was moved that the Malians want this to happen in the next six months. Um, so John Panic responded to the Malians gift with a commitment to another six-figure gift that might double the Maylene's gift and to which, yes, that might double the Maylene's gift. His purpose is to inspire others to give with great generosity to make this fund even larger. This fund in honor of Wally and Barbara Stewart. So with that said, I really want to thank this dynamic trio of John and Barbara Meline and John Panic. May you three glimpse the import and the power for the good of your faithful, wise, and daring generosity. Um, this then is a very appropriate moment to call upon Rebecca Stewart, 
who is the daughter of Wally and Bobby Stewart. Rebecca. Hi, everyone. I am very grateful, but, and this would, well, my dad did get a chance to know that this was a possibility. He had a great conversation with Sarah Wilson and um, we're, it's incredibly moving and it's so appropriate for my mom and dad. My sister is um, actually has some words that she'd like to say, Deborah. So, and she's much more um, eloquent than me. So, I'm going to pass this over to my sister, Deborah. But you have to unmute your mic, Deborah. Hello, can you hear me now? Okay, great. All right, hi, I'm Deborah, Wally's daughter in Japan. It's 10 a.m. tomorrow here where I am. And I want to thank you for inviting my sister, Rebecca and I. And I want to express our thanks to PLTS and especially to John and Barbara Maylene and to John Panic too. Sarah Wilson came to Philadelphia in July to talk to dad about the Maylene's generous contribution in his name. And he was delighted to meet with her and hear that he was being remembered at the Center for Climate Justice and Faith. There's his picture, hi dad. It was really not long after that, that dad's condition deteriorated. So this was just perfect timing for Sarah to come and visit with him. He and we, we're so excited to see opportunities for training in climate justice, ethics and action, going to students all over the world, both lay and clergy. And personally, we were all moved to know that dad's work in social ethics has been remembered. And now that he's no longer with us, it's even more moving for my sister and I to see his work and everything he believed in continuing at the center. I was working on this and I could see him up in heaven, smiling and making understatements like he always does, saying something like, well, that's how I hoped it would work out, not bad. I'm sure he's very thankful to all of you. So from us and from dad, thank you so much for this wonderful recognition. Thank you. Oh, nice pictures. <laughs> On this extraordinary Founders Day of 2022, again, I extend my sincere appreciation to all of those who have been contributed today and to, um, to the stewards as well. The gifts that we unveil today, as Cynthia said, not only provide long-term security for the center, but living gifts provide the immediate contributions that we need to do the fantastic work of today. So while it is true that I challenged um, myself and my team to raise $1 million before the year's end, we're set getting so close that I'm extending the challenge to 1.5. So this is what happens, that no good work and no good deed goes unpunished. So I will pledge myself to um, work with Regina biddings Muro and with Sarah Wilson and with Cynthia and with Ray and so many others here um, to do the good work, to find another $500,000 for the center. We, I believe that giving is contagious. And although in a pandemic, we don't typically want to use the word contagious to, re to re represent such positive things, I do invite all of you to help us find others that have the same kind of passion and commitment to do the work that needs to be done. And on that, I turn it back over so we can get started with the program. Let's celebrate the fantastic news that we got today. Thank you all. Well, this is a little bounce back and forth, up and down, isn't it? Um, but now we will shift, and we will shift to the to the lecture for the evening. Um, it is really, um, oh my stars, we have forgotten something. And thank you to Alicia 
Dean Alicia Vargas for reminding us. Alicia. Boy, a dean just keeps things in order. Thank <laughs> you so much. There you go. We do want to take time to honor Reverend Dr. Walter Wally Stir, and it is an honor for me to do so. Wally served the LDS as professor of ethics. Dean and President. And before that, he was a student at BLTS and a graduate from BLTS. What I remember most about Wally is the spark in his eyes. That spark reminds me now of his passion for justice and how he inspired his students to practice and to strive for love and justice in church and society. He co-taught a class with Dr. Robert Smith and Dr. F. Kalin called Bible, Church, and Will. That's exactly what he equipped his students for, for the biblical call to love and justice to be manifested in the church and in the world. For decades, PLDS has been about that love and justice. Now we've added love for our earth in our, as in our Center for Climate Justice and Faith. I was pleased about. Wally embodied PLTS and he helped cement his passion for engagement with the tangible business of love and justice that is our brand up to today. And I hope that it will ever, that it will always be. Wally is such an important part of that. As Wally embodied in many concrete ways that long standing commitment to move the church along the lines of love and justice, as he did helping to move the church toward the inclusion of women and LGBTQ plus persons in the church ministry, he brought not only courage, wisdom and tenacity, but also a sense of humor and a deep care and respect for the people around him. For that, he was admired, appreciated and loved by his students and colleagues. Wally has left a forever mark on PLTS and PLTS has been blessed by his life and his service. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the witness of your servant, Walter Sturr, and for the many gifts you bestowed on him and that he shared with PLTS. We pray now for Wally's daughters and their whole family as they live with the memories of his love for them. We're all thankful for the great privilege of knowing and loving this extraordinary man who in very quietly tenacious ways made a profound impact on so many. May our dear Wally rest in peace in your holy hands. Amen. It does feel like a sacred, a sacred evening. <laughs> um, we do move now, unless anyone else wants to raise your hand and give another thing that we, we move now to the um, to the lecture for the evening. Um, and you all, uh, I, I I want for you to know something of um, Dr. Larry Rasmussen before you listen to him, and I've been asked to introduce him. We could spend hours um, uh, acclaiming the extraordinary character and accomplishments of Larry, but I have a very few minutes. So, educator, mentor, scholar, 
church reformer, and gracious, faithful human being, all in a quest to radically reform human societies so that creation, humans included, may flourish with justice and joy. Though he is a renowned scholar, the heartbeat of his work, I think, has been teaching and mentoring. In this, he has been very creative. As the Reinhold Niebuhr Professor of Social Ethics at Union Theological Seminary in New York, the position for which he is now emeritus, Larry trooped his students around Manhattan to read its geological and social history, bid us listen to trees in the middle of Manhattan, speak the language of ethics in music, and he believed in us, even if we did not. Teaching and his hunger for a more just and ecologically sane world shape Larry's scholarship. His work is remarkable, not only in quantity and scope and intellectual quality. Also, he is the rare academic whose writing at times is poetic. It is infused with beauty. He is an artist or a musician of words. Larry Rasmussen is known as one of the world's foremost ecological ethicists. One of his books won the Grunmeyer Award, best book in the world for the year, and another earned both the gold and the grand prize for the Nautilus Book Awards. Both volumes call religion and the human species to radical reorientation toward earth-honoring, justice-centered forms of religion and ways of being human that replace human beings into Earth's web of life. Larry is the author or co-author of 10 volumes, editor or co-editor of several, and has published more than 100 chapters and articles. I know because I counted them. Um, he is widely recognized as a leading Bonhoeffer scholar. However, his most memorable written work may be the one that came out just this week. It is love letters from one geological epic to another, remapping the world. It is a series of letters to his two young grandsons. Larry's intellect and his passion reach far beyond the academy to influence the church, from building an innovative Christian community in Washington, D.C., to serving on the World Council of Churches for several years as the co-coordinator of its Justice, Peace, and Integrity of Creation unit. His creative wedding of scholarship and church reformation aimed at societal reformation rendered a 10-year project called Earth Honoring Faith at Ghost Ranch in New Mexico. Larry has received substantial recognition for his leadership among the awards are the Joseph Sittler Award for Outstanding Leadership in Theological Education. He continues as a highly sought after speaker. The list of presentations worldwide fills pages. So before closing, I'd like to return to the nature of his work where I began. Larry Rasmussen holds the mystery of grace together with astute intellectual inquiry. His earth ethic was spun by a mystic who is also a disciplined and delightfully clear theological thinker, adept at the cutting edges of both cultural critique and earth sciences. I imagine Larry as as comfortable in a circle of medieval mystics as in a gathering of geophysicists. So in sum, Larry educates not only with his writing and his teaching and his thinking, but with his being and his practice. Here in this earth creature, we find integrity that weds extraordinary intellect, deep compassion, faith, an enduring commitment to social transformation. He models courage to forge uncharted paths, use of authority to uplift, 
mirth, and lightness of being, and the power generated when colleagues love and respect one another. He shows what it means to be a spirit-led activist intellectual and a theoethicist of the church, academy, and world. He teaches through his practice that we are called, all of us, to use our gifts in the long communal struggle toward a world in which none are excluded from what is needed for life in its fullness, and in which Earth's lament becomes a song of life given and received. All of this, deep wisdom, he teaches by embodying it and does so with grace, humor, brilliance, elegance of word, humility, and gratitude mixed with awe for the splendor of life. How fitting it is that on this evening, he should be our speaker on this momentous Founders Day at Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary. Larry, welcome. Thank you, Kirsten. Good evening. Let me put this over here. Um, and, and thank you, Cindy. It's wonderful to be introduced uh, by a friend, um, even if, maybe especially if, it's a bit over the top. <laughs> um, I want to say thanks to uh, PLTS and Cal Lutheran for the invitation to congratulate the Center for uh, Climate justice and faith, and to thank as someone outside of it for the, the generous support that has been given. It's also an honor to dedicate this lecture to the memory of Wally Storr. And I think Wally would ap appreciate this little bit of humor here. <laughs> yeah, we can just take that in a bit. Um, so the question tonight is, is today's planetary trauma the catalyst for refounding our way of life? Now, the French philosopher, Francois-Marie Voltaire, you have the dates there, is our guide. Three things exercise a constant influence over the minds of men, humankind, climate, government, and religion. That is the only way of explaining the enigma of the world. Voltaire opens Philip Jenkins's remarkable work, you have it here, Climate, Catastrophe, and Faith, How Changes in Climate Drive Religious Upheaval. You and I might have seeded government and religion as veteran influences helping explain the enigma of the world. But climate? Other than Voltaire, who said that? Yet Jenkins's global study of both climate and religious upheaval shows that major climate changes consistently drive political, economic, social, and religious upheaval. So how did we miss climate? Why did we miss climate? If it's essential to explaining the enigma of the, this world, why were we absent the eyes to see it and the ears to hear it? The answers are two, I think. First, in the geological record, the only period as stable as our own is our own. That's Elizabeth Colbert referring to the last 11,700 years, the geological epoch that has hosted all human civilizations bar none. It's called the late Holocene and its tattoo is climate stability. 
The median temperature of climate never varies more than two degrees, that is 3.7 degrees Fahrenheit. Before that, Earth is simply fickle. To be sure, in the Holocene, planetary systems were still plotting the play and directing the drama. But we hardly noticed because climate friendliness created dependable habitats that to us Holoceners seemed the way creation has always been. The creation we knew is the one Earth had always been. Well, that was our assumption. While the natural world did have its convulsions and the four horsemen of the apocalypse in the book of Revelation had their day, famine, plague, death, and war, Overall, the Holocene was uncommonly, indeed uniquely, clement. Seasons were steady enough to make agriculture possible, together with settled societies and cities. Plants and animals could be domesticated and fitted to place. Divisions of labor could come about, together with writing, inventing, and homegrown science. Though it's startling, it is not coincidental that the earliest civilizations all arose at the same time in far-flung places, whether in China, India, Egypt, Persia, or Mexico. A climate-friendly Holocene created civilization, at least its possibility. How important is that to who we are and who the ancestors have been? Our brand of humans, Homo sapiens sapiens, have been marching around and making love for 200 to 300,000 years. But sapien civilizations have only existed for the last 10 to 12,000 years. <clears throat> now, since we had big brains, native intelligence and lots of life experience long before any civilizations emerged. Why the wait? Why the delay of a couple hundred thousand years? Why is civilization an exception even for us? Because settled societies had to wait for the big ice sheets to recede to the poles and a long stretch of climate moderation to settle in. Thanks to climate, all the settled societies we have ever known developed within a very narrow temperature band with governance and religion riding sidecar. So, if climate stability is a requisite, a prerequisite for civilized society, what do we do now? When climate volatility and planetary uncertainty are the surest thing. This is <clears throat> how we should live now, is the challenge that present and future generations face. The challenge is made immeasurably more difficult for reason number two, not only has our geological epoch been the only stable one, but the recent centuries of industrialization, modernization, and urbanization fostered certain sticky illusions and a false sense of security. Here's how it happened. Stored, compact, portable energy in the form of fossil fuels, let us build human habitat anywhere there was land and actually in the water in a few places too. That capacity for safe, set apart human habitat coupled to dependable agriculture seemed to release us from the bondage of climate known to all bygone societies, dependent as they were for both food and shelter on the whims of the seasons. Except for farmers, we no longer had to conform our livelihoods to seasons. Add modern science and technology 
in an industrialized and a globalized world, and sovereign human control of nature seemed triumphant. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, organization replaced nature to largely stave off the menace of nature. This apparent control of nature nurtured three illusions. The illusions that we humans are separate from nature, the illusion that we control what we create, and the illusion that we're the centerpiece in the grand scheme of things. <laughs> now all of that has been shattered by, guess what? climate. Ironically so, because the present wild out of control climate is the consequence of global warming induced by, guess again, the very processes of industrialization, modernization, and urbanization that created the stupor of human sovereignty and its illusion. In short, we missed how climate explained our world. At least I did. I taught Christian ethics for three decades and readings in geology and climate were never part of it. I never taught Jenkinson's insight that the transformation of religious faith had paralleled climate catastrophe. So you may be surprised, as I was, to find that in several earlier periods of Christian history, the book of Revelation is the most cited of all scriptural works. Its Greek title is Apocalypsis. Or more broadly, you may be surprised that the libretto of Jewish, Christian, and other religious scriptures is riddled with climate catastrophe and even geological convulsion. Or you may be surprised that there were a couple of climate deviations in the normally stable Holocene, and one of them was the Protestant Reformation. It happened during the 500 years of climate extremity called the Little Ice Age, an age that was also the age of the bubonic plague, political and social upheaval, persecution, witch hunts, and religious wars that never seemed to stop. The Thirty Years' War, the Hundred Years' War. Little Ice Age followed upon the other climate anomaly, the medieval warming period, where there were, when there were, and where there were vineyards in England and fig trees in Germany. And enough clement weather to build soaring cathedrals that often took more than a century to complete. I only add that folks then didn't get the causal climate ties to climate either, nor could they have. They didn't have climate science, much less the global client, global climate science records that we and Philip Jenkins can tap. They too thought that their experience of creation was the way creation had always behaved. I'm gonna come back to what we do when climate volatility and planetary uncertainty push aside the Holocene ways of life. Let's turn to the other factors Voltaire says are needed to explain the enigma of this world. First, governance. Okay. The gravity of next week's elections weighs heavily upon us. President Biden says we face the greatest collective threat this nation has known. Climate change, the pandemic, gross inequality, racial injustice, abdication of global leadership, and attacks on the key institutions of democracy itself. Truth, trust, and elections. It tallies as a battle for the very soul of America, he says. And those patriots who vehemently oppose him agree. 
The battle is for the soul of America. <laughs> Different versions. Here's the conversation that haunts me. Isabel Wilkerson, author of Cast, is talking with Taylor Branch, the esteemed historian of the civil rights movement. Wilkerson wants Branch's thoughts <clears throat> about white citizens' response to the prediction that by 2042, the United States population will be a majority of racial minorities. We'll be a majority minority nation, as some states already are, like my New Mexico. People were angry when the predictions came out. People said they wouldn't stand for being a minority in their own country. Branch replies. Now there are troops at the border, Wilkerson adds, and shootings of black and brown and Jewish people. The last reference came just days after the massacre at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. Taylor nods thinking <clears throat> and then asks, so the real question would be, if people were given the choice between democracy and whiteness, how many would choose whiteness? Has it come to this, that most whites would rather live in a white authoritarian state than in a multiracial democracy in which they are a minority? This haunts me because white identity politics was the driver in the 2020 election. White fear, white grievance, white nationalism, white privilege, white supremacy. And in that election, Trump had enough charisma to embolden millions who felt betrayed by elites and indeed felt forgotten altogether. Trump cut a channel for the pent up anger of those who felt they were losing their country. This was white identity roused and put on defense. When white privilege is assumed, as mine has been most of my life, it doesn't even surface among whites. But when it feels menaced and under attack, it's a virulent force fighting the fear that white ruled America is ending. Whiteness is a hell of a drug, one commentator says. It issues in race-laced patriotism. So the stakes are high in this election, all the more so because the possibilities of ungovernability are real as our social and ecological collapse. A disaster of some sort, even a major one, say a cascading climate event or several, or a pandemic doesn't of itself result in collapse, however, although disasters do expose society's fault lines. Collapse comes when societies are unable to coordinate their response with sufficient means at sufficient scale to meet the larger than life challenges. Systemic racism, systemic inequality, and climate emergencies may be challenges that are too potent for us. They need not be, but they may be. So Voltaire's third factor is religion. I'm changing that to faith because I want to explore faith in the context of the early Anthropocene where we are now. <clears throat> the Anthropocene could not be part of Voltaire's discussion and it only arises for Jenkins very late in his book. But the Anthropocene has to get our attention because its question is what do we do when climate volatility and mass uncertainty direct the human drama. 
Uh, I'm going to do a little shameless promotion here. <clears throat> and I've, I, uh, I have cards up here. Please pick one up. It'll send you to the place where you can get the book. The book is here. You'll find that in the book, when I write to Eduardo and Martin, um, I'm a rather uh, severe critic of capitalism, but it doesn't kick in until the books are sold. So, <clears throat> okay, what do we do when climate volatility and mass uncertainty direct the human drama? That's the question behind uh, letters to Nyla's and my grandkids. I'll read you the author's note and then just a couple paragraphs from the first letter to Eduardo. Here's the author's note. I knew my grandchildren confronted the harrowing challenge of moving from industrial to ecological civilization. The great transition, it's called, epic times. I was ready for that. But my pen was startled to discover a truth that's taken us by stealth. That for the first time ever, humanity's become a geological force. We've slid off the back end of the <clears throat> one geological epoch, the Holocene, onto the front end of another, the Anthropocene, the age of the human. Thus we face epic times as well as epic times and a further daunting transition. These transitions are the great work, that's phrases Thomas Berry's, <clears throat> that awaits my grandchildren. Though they were never asked and didn't get a vote, remapping and remaking the world amidst uncertainty is their calling, as it is ours. While their world cannot be ours and shouldn't be, I wanted to step away from an academic career teaching social ethics and just write love letters. Love letters that face what they face on a changed and changing planet. I'm certain the letters are urgent. Not because the kids' grandparents are frail, but because their world is. And here are our first paragraphs of the <clears throat> letter to Eduardo, January 15, 2018. Dear Eduardo, this is the love letter, but not the usual. Of course, Grandma Nyla and I, along with your abuelos in Colombia, match doting grandparents anywhere. Our affection lacks nothing. Yet this is the very first letter in the whole history of love that consciously sends love from grandparents in one geological epoch to a grandchild in another. From the late Holocene to the early Anthropocene. That's weird. It's also important because the Anthropocene is the time of your life, while the Holocene is the time of ours. To us, this language is strange. Yet probably not to you if you are reading this as a young adult. Now you're just a preschooler. <clears throat> Unlike us, you will experience the tumultuous changes that straddle a new geological epoch. While human history and human experience was the main subject for us, earth science and planetary experience will likely be yours. Our human drama is a chapter in Earth's drama, and Earth's drama is a chapter in the galaxies. You belong to the journey of the universe. I awoke this morning to write of your geological epoch and mine. I suspect you already know from school and your smartwatch that Holocene means the holy recent epoch, ours, while Anthropocene, yours, means the age of the human, from Anthropos, Greek for human. God only knows why all geologists speak Greek.
It's hopelessly nerdy to include a graph. What love letter features a science graph? Follow the line from the last 11,000 years to zero. That's the late Holocene. The variation is less than one degree Celsius, 1.7 degrees Fahrenheit, above the baseline to less than one degree below it. This small two degree Celsius difference is rare in Earth's history. Look how erotic the line is before it flattens. Earth is normally fickle. Okay, that's the end of the excerpt. Now let's glimpse uh, the Holocene as the age of the human and then finish with religion and faith. Previous human powers did not alter every major sphere of Earth. We didn't revamp the chemistry of the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, and the cryosphere, that's water and ice. We didn't wrinkle the lithosphere, the Earth's crust, <clears throat> or bludgeon the biosphere, the community of life. Previous powers did not show homo sapien dominance to such an extent that as of the year 2000, the mammalian mass of humans and their domestic animals was 97% of the global total leaving a scant 3% for wildlife. Previous human powers didn't show a rate of extinction either that's 100 times greater than the background rate of the past 2 million years. Background rate mean species come and go all the time. The background rate is what that uh, refers to. The proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences calls this, quote, biological annihilation and planetary defaunation with biodiversity itself in grave crisis. In but a wink of geological time, modern humans have been changing Earth's systems themselves. Nor did human presence and powers make us the co-evolutionary force that we are now. Consider this, paleoclimatologists studying planetary cycles tell us that good Holoceners were due to move into the next ice age in 50,000 years. We've been living um, between planetary ice ages, interglacial uh, period. But our global warming, most of it since 1950, has suppressed that cycle and perhaps the following ice age due in 130,000 years. Without the foggiest notion <clears throat> of what we are doing, we are overriding some of the planet's most ingrained patterns. That holds for both immediate patterns, this year's fire season, next year's sea level and drought, as well as those patterns so far out of sight that our mushy brain can't take them in, like ice age returns. The going term for what humans collectively are doing is, quote, assisted evolution, unquote. But assisted evolution hides the depth, breadth, and temporal reach of Anthropocene powers. Would you have guessed, guessed from assisted evolution that our extra carbon would alter marine chemistry, flood coastlines, strip glaciers to bare bones, embolden deserts, warp the circulation of ocean currents, supercharge extreme weather events and rearrange the distribution of animal, plant, and microbial species around the globe? Would you have guessed from assisted evolution that every single major taxonomic group, animals, insects, plants, fungi, and microorganisms is being driven down new evolutionary paths by human-charged events? 
many to the dead end of extinction. Does assisted evolution lay out the powers to snip, paste, and engineer DNA so as to redraft the script of life by which the script by which the book of life is written into every single cell of every life form. Assisted evolution is room temperature talk that does not begin to reveal that we've created no analog climates, no analog ecosystems, and a whole new no analog future. This is not evolution assisted. This is evolution hacked and hijacked. In short, for the first time in the human venture, humankind collectively has become a geological and not simply an historical force. And please note that you can't dial back a geological epoch. Two images from William Du Bois finish our description of the Anthropocene. The images of Petri Earth and Hospice Earth. Petri Earth alludes to the dish in the lab, you know, where the exponential growth of bacteria soon saturate the dish. The bacteria crowd out most everything else. Let me illustrate Petri Earth with some now famous graphs. The graphs didn't have Earth as a Petri dish in mind when they came into being, but they show it dramatic, dramatically. The graphs have come to be called the Great Acceleration. And what I want you to notice is just the shape of these sometimes called hockey stick graphs, sometimes J graph. The top ones are uh, CO2, nitrous oxide, and methane concentration. And you see the, where that's going. And then ozone depletion, there's been some real good work uh, being done there, though, to cut, cut that. Uh, change of climate temperature, great floods, uh, ocean ecosystems, coastal structure, biochemistry of the oceans, terrestrial ecosystems, loss of tropical rainforests and woodland, uh, terrestrial ecosystems, amount of domesticated land, global diversity. And the conventional date here is 1750 as the conventional date of the onset of the Industrial Revolution. So this is to show you what has happened. Um, <clears throat> and, and you'll also notice that 1950 and post-World War II globalization of a consumerist economy makes a big difference here. Now the drivers though are human population and total gross domestic or gross international uh, product. Gross um, in foreign investment goes way up. The damming of river goes way up. Water use goes up. Fertilizer consumption. What I love are McDonald's restaurants. They're keeping up with the rest of this. Uh, paper consumption, telephones, motor vehicles, international tourism. <laughs> It's all the same pattern because it's driven by the same, uh, by the human presence and the uh, size of the economy. I'm, capitalism has been enormously successful in producing wealth and making it possible for lots of us, all, probably all of us uh, in this room. Okay, that's Petri Earth. <laughs> that's Earth as a, <clears throat> Petri dish. Um, now, Hospice Earth is uh, Bill de Buise's second image. De Buise knows that the name can be misleading. It doesn't mean that Earth's death is imminent. It's not. Wild Earth has gotten along fine without us for all but a very tiny fraction of its life all but 0 0.7 of Earth's timeline to date is us. <laughs> what Du Bois means by hospice Earth is that some aspects of Earth are degrading and dying. 
largely at our hands and that these diminishing and dying sectors need our care as hospice caregivers. Though he's an atheist, de Buys uses scriptural images and language for this. For example, he urges us to build arcs, explicitly alluding to Noah, as well as to his own career as a conservationist. And he recognizes the deep spiritual needs for the human dominated epoch that we're initiating. That means people paying attention to their own experience of eco-anxiety and eco-lament. <clears throat> um, as well as people searching out the continuing beauty and utter grandeur of Earth. It means, de Buys also says, finding grace for our grief. Our role as hospice earth caregivers is twofold. One, making the patient as comfortable as possible, able to enjoy its remaining days. And two, cultivating the holy rage of the prophets as we confront the truth that we are now both ark and flood. So how do we proceed? How do we proceed when people's confidence in the sources and systems of Holocene stability is gone? We walk by faith. But what is that now? On this walk, you're off on the wrong foot if you identify faith with certitude. Certitude is a perversion of faith. Faith isn't about living with certainty. It's confident, even joyous living with profound mystery and intractable uncertainty. Uncertainty about even what the moral will bring. Absolute certainty has no need of faith. You're off on the wrong foot as well if you extend certitude to traditional Christian understandings. As Dietrich, ask Dietrich Bonhoeffer about this. I never leave home without Dietrich. Um, while he didn't have the vocabulary for ecology and the Anthropocene, those are more recent than 1944, he cut to the heart of both of them with scalpel precision. Enlightenment science and technology had led to unprecedented human power in which, Bonhoeffer says, everything now turns on humanity. What this has done, as we noted, is replace nature with human organization, including the human organization of nature itself. And this organization has been remarkably effective, except well, listen to Bonhoeffer. The human being is thrown back on his own resources. He's learned to cope with everything except himself. He can insure against everything but other human beings. <laughs> In the end, it all comes down to the human being, end quote. He calls this new context the world come of age, alluding to what happens when a person comes of age. The young person come of age is now responsible for his or her own actions and cannot sign, assign responsibility for those over to the parents any longer. Even the law doesn't permit that. But Bonhoeffer doesn't say person come of age. He says world come of age, meaning that because of pervasive, cumulative, collective human powers, Everything now turns on human choices and actions for which we are responsible. The whole world has now arrived at that point, has come of age, and Bonhoeffer sets out in his prison cell to continue his work on a comprehensive ethic of responsibility to understand and guide these human powers. 
He pauses in that, however, because this dramatic new epoch raises anew the most fundamental theological and faith questions. What is Christianity, he asks, and who is Jesus Christ for us today? With the emphasis falling on for us today. Think Anthropocene, though Boniford doesn't have the word. The foundations are being pulled out, he said, from all that Christianity has previously been for us. Who is God, he asks. And then he lists traditional base points of faith that must be formulated anew. Creation, fall, reconciliation, faith, vita nova, the <clears throat> new life, last things, end quote. What is it you really believe such that you'd stake your life on it, he asks. What creed would you write? I add that such a creed doesn't confer certitude or guarantee outcomes. It says what in faith you'd risk your life for amidst uncertainty and in a time when everything turns on our choices and our actions. Bonhoeffer asks all these faith questions because he's convinced this world of Petri Earth, human presence, lacks a guiding spirituality and ethic. If you listen to the world of social pundits, they put it this way. We've lost a guiding narrative. We're without stories or we're between stories or we're amid incompatible stories. Now, my response to our existential emergency is that we should walk by faith. Walking means a pilgrimage. As Nepalese Buddhists say, every day a yatra, a pilgrimage. While pilgrimage means traveling light, it's spiritually rich. You carry all your care with you on pilgrimage. Joy and sorrow, grief and anticipation, hope and community, belief and doubt, and steadiness and determination amid a readiness for surprise and discovery. On pilgrimage, there's time for contemplation and prayer, time for reflection and new thoughts, time for hard thinking about that creed that you'd live by. In a word, for us, walking by faith resets the soul. For many of us, the goal of this pilgrimage is nothing less than refounding our way of life or founding another. I say many, but not all. The agents of the planetary mess we're in were not human beings acting as a single tribe. They were those who fashioned the modern world on the basis of slavery, conquest, colonization, and consumerism through an extractive, profit-driven, and growth-obsessed mode of living. These were the white originated and largely white run systems and structures that have dominated nature and peoples together. And they are those systems and structures from which I and many of you have benefited. Those who suffered the downside of that way of life and its history had to learn long ago to walk by faith in order to find their way in a new world. The world had not ended, Earth carried on, but their worlds did. I am thinking chiefly of African Americans and Native Americans and other indigenous peoples. Their lands were lost, all that was sacred to them was stolen or forbidden, and they were robbed of their cultures, their languages, their life ways, even their children sometimes. They had to found or refound a way of life in alien territory. They had to walk by faith 
on a pilgrimage they did not choose so as to fashion a way of life that could sustain them on patches of the planet they had not previously known. Now, when you and I are both the exiled and the exilers on an earth we have made hospice earth, we would do well to look to the wisdom of those who were forced, as we are now, to found or refound a different way of life. This is the pilgrimage we walk by faith in a time of both biological and cultural collapse. Now, now you get to see the sweet grandchildren. These and their generation in all colors are those for whom you do your work. But this walk by faith is only for grown-ups. And I can only praise the Center for Climate Justice and Faith for recruiting and further educating the kind of grown-ups needed for the good and great work ahead. So here's a shout out. These are the beautiful grandparents. <laughs> um, yeah, if you, if you, like I said, shameless promotion. If you want, you can go to a website, larrywrites.info. And I'm encouraging people to write their own letters, whether to their grandchildren or any in among future generations for whom they care. And then on the website, uh, if they are willing to share them, and then we'll just get a uh, conversation going as people read each other's uh, letters. Okay, uh, just finishing with a little bit of wisdom. Nothing that is worth doing can be achieved in our lifetime. Therefore, we must be saved by hope. Nothing which is true or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history. Therefore, we must be saved by faith. Nothing <clears throat> we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone. Therefore, we are saved by love. No, accomp no virtuous act is quite as virtuous from the standpoint of our friend or foe as it is from our standpoint. Therefore, we must be saved by the formal, final form of love, which is forgiveness. And I only add to that, that you get the wrong, it leaves you with the wrong impression if you think that brings you to a position of kind of giving up or complacency. Uh, any, anybody who was around Reinhold Niebuhr <laughs> would know that this is the kind of big picture that also fueled deep engagement in the issues of the days and efforts to uh, address them. Well, thank you all. Yeah, if you call the time on it, right? Yeah, sure. We have time for uh, two or three questions for Larry. If there is like a microphone here, anybody? I I appreciated what you said towards the end about um, learning from people who, through no choice of their own, have had to to, to walk by faith. And I think you know where I'm going with this, the sort of, okay, now you all have figured it out and us white folks are going to take over what you learned. Uh, uh, uh. So, you know, what, what do you deal, I mean, I'm exaggerating, but how do you yeah. deal with that kind of teaching? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm reading uh, Stephen Charleston's book, The Four Vision Quests of Jesus right now. And, um, and he's a very gentle, gracious human being, a Choctaw leader who is an Episcopal bishop i think but uh anyway 
uh, he lists all those things that we we've, we've taken. We want to be Indians, you know, <laughs> and so we take over Indian spirituality and we do so on and so forth. And it's a uh, um, it's a it's an, it's another case of kind of not so subtle colonization, you know, in many ways. There are there are important ways of making common cause that uses that. I mean, I, I have a Dine friend in Santa Fe, Mary Hasba Russell, and I wanted to use one of the Dine or Navajo um, prayers for a blessing for my niece's wedding. So I asked Mary if if I could do that, if that would be okay. And she said, great, fine, just make attribution of it. I mean, we don't have to always be colonized. <laughs> there are ways of making uh, common cause. But it, it, it goes deep in us to want to be in control. And I think one of the things that critical race theory has shown came out of legal uh, race theory is how the unconscious um, elements of our being are at play there. We're not even fully conscious of how much we want to be directing uh, the drama and, and <laughs> you know, plotting and the, the play. So it's just, it's a good thing you, you bring up and the, the best thing is to be with other folks who are not white folk, who, who are good friends, who can tell you what it is you're missing. And the same, I, I just said, Mary, Hospa Russell, her husband, uh, Joe Nyhart, is a Canadian, Anglo, and Joe has been working with First Nations people as a doctor for a very long time. And <clears throat> he told me, every time something comes up, and he has a reaction to what what uh, native people are thinking every time he's been wrong <laughs> and, and this you know this comes from someone who is a life is immersed there you just got to sit down and be good friends and, and and talk these things over as best you can <laughs> yeah well, I, just yeah. i wonder if you'd say more i mean you made an interesting connection between our illusion and desire for control and our kind of separation from nature. Yeah. That, that seems to be at the kind of the root of this. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think, and it's not just white folks. Um, I think we all think that we have some kind of control over what we create and that it's good. <laughs> um, I mean, Every revolutionary that you read thinks their revolution is the last one necessary, and it's written in the stars, you know. So uh, this illusion that we control what we create, and <clears throat> when coupled with enormous success, I mean, what about the productivity of food that's been possible by way of modern agricultural? I mean, it's these benefits that lead us to couple our um, our sense of control and our sense that we can make uh, we can make history turn out right um and again i don't i mean my default as cindy's and a lot of people in the room is always education but i know that's not <laughs> the only thing uh here we we need need to be uh need to be pushed and not just asked. Yeah, here's a question over here, Ray. Thank you so much, Dr. Rasmussen. Yeah, your lecture today actually like it recompasses yeah, like yeah, summarizes what we have done in 2018 spring. Thank you so much for reminding me. Uh-huh. Yeah. And my question will be, since you em emphasize highly on the walk in the faith, yeah. and uh, there will be a different forms of faith around the world. Yes. Like, as a Christian, how can we, like, like, yeah, engage other forms of faith to seek the solidarity? How can we, yeah. Um, yeah. 
Nyla, my wife, and I read from a book that we've chosen a few pages uh, after breakfast each morning. The one we're reading now is a Living Buddha, Living Christ by Thich Nhat Hanh. I have learned so much good Christian theology from him in that book, and I'm just I'm struck dumbfounded by the depth of his, um, in his case, it comes out of the experience that he has had uh, with lots of Christians. And uh, in the last part of the book, Earth Honoring Faith, there's a typology that I put together in which on the one hand, I uh, talk about a deep, shared interfaith tradition and over against some destructive force on earth. So it's uh, asceticism or the simple life vis-a-vis -vis consumerism, or it's the sacred vis-a-vis -vis commodification, or it's um, liberation vis-a-vis -vis oppression, and so on. All of those are shared across uh, religious traditions. Uh, and th that so that monks of whatever religion understand one another. <laughs> They're all meditating. They're all trying to live the simple life. Uh, so I, I think so much is simply being aware of the depth of commonalities. Now it gets different names and I'm not trying to um, pave over differences, but there are deep shared common streams. Um, I had a doctoral student at Union who who's a Christian, but he, his thesis was on the beginnings of Hinduism and before it became a severely caste-oriented uh, system, there, there was a whole lot of religious reform and that, that had grown up in its, its beginning. So, so <clears throat> uh, he started being an advocate for Hindu, Hindu liberation theology <laughs> because he found some strains there that didn't become part uh, in many cases of what came after. So a lot of this is um, kind of retrieval of things we've overlooked, been blind to, uh, because of the kind of capture of our imagination by our own cultures. And I, that's what I was trying to say about industrialization, modernization, urbanization. That tends to override um, streams that were there before. So um, Cindy can tell you from her own work, we find all sorts of women medieval mystics you know, that we didn't even pay attention to until this kind of retrieval. Yeah, that's probably too, too much. <laughs> yeah. For giving yeah. us a lot to think about. My pleasure. Um, yeah.